Acts 15. We're going verse by verse through the book of Acts. And today's passage in Acts 15 actually has a lot to do with mothers, which is surprising. I have a picture up in front of you of me surrounded by three women. On the left is my mother. She was 25 years old at the time this picture was taken. In the middle is my grandmother, my mother's mother, and she is holding me. And I'm sitting there on her lap looking rather clueless. And on the right there is my great-grandmother. And she was, I think, getting close to 90 at this point. But what we have here is mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, and right in the middle there's me. And I'm very grateful for the family blessings that have come down in my family. One of them is longevity. My great-grandmother lived into her 90s, my grandmother lived well into her 90s, and my mother is 87 and going on 57. And so it's... Uh, one of those blessings in my family. I intend to live a long time, and I hope so, because I've got a lot of things to do before uh, I check out of this life. And so I'm very grateful for that gift of, of longevity. I'm also very grateful for the gift of faith, which came down through all of them. My great-grandmother on the right there was a French-Canadian Catholic and uh, very quirky, a very interesting person. My grandmother was the one who taught me how to pray, and she taught me how to pray with me sitting on her lap. And I was never, it's hard for you to picture someone like me being small enough to sit on her lap, but uh, I still remember her teaching me how to pray. And my mother is still a very strong woman of faith. My grandmother, great-grandmother, have gone to be with the Lord. But uh, my mother is the one who first told me about Jesus. And I remember sitting on a little piano bench in our house, and she brought me this little plastic cross on a stand, and she said, Jesus died for your sins. I had no idea what that meant, but it sounded important, so I said, that's good, and uh, kind of went along with that at that point. So it's Mother's Day 2023. We're looking at Acts 15, and where this connects is the fact that all of you have a physical mother, and also you have access to a second mother, and that second mother doesn't come across in English very well, but that second mother is the church. The church is like a second mother to which we have access, and you've taken advantage of that access here today showing up. What we're looking at in the book of Acts are the baby pictures of the church. Now, the word in Greek and Latin for the church is ecclesia, and ecclesia, if you've ever learned a foreign language like Spanish, French, German, who here has learned a foreign language with genders? where you got to get mixed up with all the, you know, it, it, it's fascinating. In, in German, you'd say der Stuhl, and you'd say he, you wouldn't say it, because things have genders. And the church, in the languages of Greek and Latin, has a gender, ecclesia, and is symbolized by a woman. And that woman is on your right, she's holding the Bible. And on the left, you have synagoga, which is the symbol for the synagogue, our Hebrew heritage, with her scroll there. And you have synagoga and ecclesia, Virtues and collective people groups are often in different languages in feminine um, linguistic gender. You have a Statue of Liberty, it's not a guy. It's the Statue of Liberty. On top of the courthouse, there's justice, and it's a woman with a blindfold, and she's got the, the scales out there. So your second mother to which you have access is the church. So on Mother's Day, it's fitting to talk about our physical mothers, and it's fitting also to talk about our spiritual mother, which is the church. We talk about God being our father, and in most every other language but English, people say she for the church. In fact, I was watching a program, a Bible teaching this morning, that was talking about the church, and the commentator in English was calling the church her, which is traditional in the church to call the church her. You have a picture here of a woman giving, who's just given birth to a newborn just barely given birth. Your first birth was from your physical mother. And your second birth was within the womb, so to speak, of the church. Your second birth, your spiritual growth and spiritual birth is in the church. The Bible says in John 3 that we must be born again. 
So we give thanks for our first birth, and we give thanks for our second birth. And the truth is, none of us would be believers without Christians. The Christian faith is a team sport. It is a group activity. And we come together to do these things. Uh, Karen, when you go on a mission trip, it really helps to have a team along. There's something about praying in the mornings and doing things together as a group. The singing up here was done by a group. This church is led by a team of trustees. We get together, and you might think we just do business meetings. But what we basically do is we pray and we seek the Lord on the big questions. We just did that this last week because we're facing all kinds of challenges with our landlord church, Surf City Church over here that meets in the sanctuary. Their denomination wants to close them down, and we're facing all kinds of stuff with that. So we're not stressing about it because we're seeking the Lord, and we're seeking the Lord together. We're doing it together. And so we have Mother's Day, and we honor our physical mothers and our spiritual mother, the church. And there's something really special about mothers. Because if you're drowning, you're either going to call for Jesus or mom, one of the two. That's just, you know, Bob, Jesus. You know, it just says, if you're ever in one of those situations where you're in a tough spot, those are the two kind of words that come up. Because our mothers, whether they were our physical mothers or our adopted mothers or people that were like mothers, were our protectors and the people who fed us and the people who made sure that we were safe. And those are the people we go to. If you skin your knee, you generally don't go to dad. You yell for mom to do what? Kiss and make it better. That's what moms do. We go to our fathers generally for blessing. We really want to have the blessing of our fathers, and we want to have the healing from our mothers. That's just one of those things. God made the world male and female for a reason. Both working together make this fantastically rich experience of human life. So we've got our first birth. We've got our second birth. We've got ecclesia, the church. We've got uh, all of these things working together. And I have to ask you a question. And this has to do with our Bible passage. We're going to get to it in just, just a second here. How do we make decisions in life? What guides us? There are so many decisions we have to make. You're going to be making dozens of decisions today. Lower level decisions, like how many blueberries do I put on this piece of toast? And bigger ones, like do I call that person back because this could change the course of my life? There are little ones and big ones, but we make decisions all day. And my question to you is, on what basis do we make those decisions? On what basis do we follow a certain path through life? And you might say, well, I just want to follow what the Bible says. Well, the Bible doesn't always tell us very much about specific situations. The Bible is great for general situations. Not so much for real specific stuff. Should I get my car fixed on Monday or Wednesday? Should I get a second opinion about chemo? Should I, should I take that job in, in Tulsa? If you've ever watched the Friends show, uh, Chandler had a job thing in, in, in Tulsa. Should I go there? Uh, it's not in the Bible. The word Tulsa won't be there. The word chemo won't be there and anything else. And the Bible is super at generic stuff. Reach the lost. Feed the hungry. Don't kill people respect human life, don't commit adultery. There's a lot of great guidance in the Bible, but for those decisions that are personal, we have to seek something else. So my question is, on what basis do you make decisions? Well, based on rationality. Well, what is that rationality based on? There's presuppositions about what's fair, what's justice. We've been arguing about that for the whole history of the human race. What guides us in our lives. The truth is, when you first started life and first started making decisions, whose influence was the strongest? Look at the picture on the screen. It was your mom. Your mother was the one, probably, most likely, whether it was your adopted mother, physical mother, or someone who raised you, it was that person who first helped you discern right from wrong. Don't put your hand on the stove. Don't cross the street when there's cars here. Don't eat with your fingers, especially when there's guests around. You know, the, the, those kinds of things. We learn those things from our mother. How many of you are still have your mother's voice in the back of your head sometimes when you're tempted to do something you shouldn't do because your mom wouldn't want you to do it? There's, there's some of those things that are there. Some of us had strict mothers. Some of us had very relaxed mothers. 
But all of our mothers influenced how we do things. They start to set a pattern in our lives for how we do things. So let's look at today's Bible passage. This is in the book of Acts, Acts 15, verse 28. And we're going to look at just the very first part of it. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Let's stop there for a second, because there is so much in this phrase. This phrase is one of the keys to making decisions. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. We have a spiritual connection and also a collective human thing, us and the Holy Spirit. There's no individual in this passage. This is a collective thing. And I want to look at the passage, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Now, those of you who know me know that I love to go deep into what's behind the scenes in the Bible. And so this passage was spoken in Aramaic. Now, the truth is the Bible was written in Greek, but we know that this was spoken in Aramaic because James and Peter were at this meeting and their main language was Aramaic and Paul could probably go along with that just fine. And they're in Jerusalem where everybody speaks Aramaic. And there's something really cool about Aramaic that this is going to connect you with this verse to the Lord's Prayer. There's a mechanism in Aramaic where if you say, it's like this, which causes that. I'm going to teach you an Aramaic word. Repeat it after me, akeno. Okay, you say akeno, and then after akeno, you say, don't say it yet, you say duh, and you say af. Akeno duh this, af that. Akeno duh this, af that. means on earth as it is in heaven. Akeno de bashmayu af baro. This is a very common Aramaic structure for speaking. This thing leads to this thing. And we know that they were speaking Aramaic, even though this was written in Greek, because it's using this construction. And we see it here. This is the native way of speaking, and it's really, really beautiful. And we see the word sebyanok. The word sebyanok is the pleasure or the will, much like in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done the pleasure or the will of God, that it be done. And so what it says here is, this is Acts 5, 28, 15, 28. Your will, the will, the pleasure, the will of the Holy Spirit, af lan, also to us. It's an akeno de uh, af. It's complicated, but follow me on this. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit, af lan to us. So it's the Holy Spirit's prompting which causes the people to receive it and work it through and apply it. Let me say that again. What we see here, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, the will of the Holy Spirit, the pleasure of the Holy Spirit leads to our deliberation and our decision. Are they basing their decision on tradition? No. Are they basing their tradition on a certain part of Scripture? No. Why? Because they didn't have a New Testament. Here was the question. The question was this. Paul had brought in non-Jews to the Christian faith and had started Gentile, non-Jewish churches. And the question was, do we have to make them Jews first? Do we have to make them Jews first? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to follow the Sabbath? Do they have to eat kosher? Do they have to do all of these other things? Do you have to become a Jew to become a Christian? Paul had converted people to the Christian faith, telling them, you don't have to. He gets called into the office. Now, if you're in charge, James and Peter are there, they're in charge. Paul gets called into the office because they have to figure this out. What are we going to do? They don't have a Bible verse to go on because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. And nobody had asked the question, what do we do with converts who are Gentiles? 
you can't go back in the Old Testament and find a, a proof first that's going to help you with that. So who do you have to rely on? You have to rely on the Holy Spirit and us delivering it, deliberating it. So when you've got nothing else to go on, we rely on the Holy Spirit and the community. Not on one person getting revelation and one person interpreting it, but the group receiving it and the group interpreting it. So honor your mother, the Bible says. Honor your father and mother that your days might be long in this world. We get started in life with our mother's voice in the back of our head. Use your inside voice. Use your manners. Don't eat with your fingers. All of those kinds of things. Make your bed, whatever it happens to be. But we outgrow our mothers, and then what do we make our decisions based on? The best thing to do is to listen to the Holy Spirit and also to work it out with community, especially with bigger decisions. Who here has made a big mistake when you did something all by yourself and didn't consult anybody? Who here has made a big mistake when you didn't consult the Holy Spirit to start with? You didn't even pray about it. Those two things become then our guideline for making decisions where the Bible is silent. And there are times when the Bible is silent about specific things. And that's where we need Christian community and listening to the Holy Spirit. Honor that mother voice when you're young, but when you get older, honor the church's voice collectively. I'm not talking institutionally. I'm not talking theologically. I'm talking working things out. If anyone in this church has a big decision to face, what we should do is we should gather around you and seek the Lord, especially if it's something which isn't covered in Scripture, and pray about it, and then work it out together, and then you'll have something to go on. And ecclesia, in a way, that's the church's voice. Follow that mother voice. You're, when you're young, your mom. When you're older, the community. There's wisdom in teams. This is why this church is led by a team. I'm the team captain, but I genuinely, when we ask the big question every month, whatever it is, and we seek the Lord on it, and we seek the Lord, we don't just pretend. We seek the Lord for like 40 minutes. And we ask him to speak into our big question especially if it's something that's not in the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible about what to do about Methodists who are suing their own congregation to get off the property. It's just nothing there. There's some certain guidelines about being honest and faithful and stuff, but there's no guidelines about exactly how to engage this. And so we have to ask the Lord and then work it out together, what we've heard from the Lord, in community. And now that the way of faith, this is Galatians 3.25, Paul says, has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. When you graduate from your mom's voice to the Christian community's voice and hearing the Holy Spirit in community, if you go from your mom's voice to nothing, then you're on your own. And you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And my biggest mistakes have been when I didn't consult the Lord or my friends in the church. I would, my fondest wish is that if we're facing a big issue, that we would bring it to a handful of people here and seek the Lord. And he gives us the answer. I know a lot of you well enough to know exactly what issues you're facing. And those issues would be so much easier and so much more stress-free if we could seek it together and pray about it and give each other guidance. Based on the Bible, but the Bible was never intended for specific little things. It just isn't. It is the greatest guide to human life ever written, but it's, all, it's for everybody at all times. It's not for you in this one specific situation. Do I take that job or not? Is this person the one? Should I, should I, should I marry this person? Do I, do I um, focus on this this week rather than that? All of that. Hear from heaven and apply it in community. Repeat after me. One, two, three. Hear from heaven and apply it in community. That's where wisdom is. Always do it biblically. Don't do things that contradict the Bible. But focus on the Holy Spirit directing us directly.
This is uh, my favorite phrase from the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus taught it in Aramaic. It's tithe makotok, newe sebionok, akeno, there's that word again, dubashmayo afbaro. Akeno, dubashmayo, as it is in heaven, afbaro, so on earth. We take the heavenly and we apply it to the earthly. And we do that through seeking the Lord together and applying it in community. So what are some practicalities here? First of all, be reborn. Experience a second birth. Your first birth from your mother, be, have that second birth of water and spirit within the church, ecclesia. Become a part of the church. The baptism has, is not just an individual thing with you and God. Sure, you can get baptized in a lake by some person who just walks by and wants to baptize you. You can do that. But it's best to do it in community. When we do baptisms here at the lake, we all gather around the person, pray over the person, we go off into the lake together, and we baptize them, not the lake, the ocean here. You baptize them here in the ocean, they come back, we cheer, we pray over them again. There's a communal, you become part of the church through baptism. That's the entry thing. Not circumcision, baptism. Second thing is, admit that you don't know very much. The older I get, the more I realize how much I don't know. When I was 25, I knew everything. My intellectual humility is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which means the Word of God is getting more and more important, and what other people in the community tell me is getting more and more important too. And that comes with age. Wisdom, having some intellectual humility. Who thinks our country would have gotten through the pandemic a whole lot better if people had, had a little bit of intellectual humility and not pretended like they knew everything? So many pundits saying so many things about stuff they don't really know about as if it's life and death. I'm thinking, people, this is bigger than you. Let's love each other. Let's work on this together. Let's, let's seek the Lord on this. Let's pay, who thinks this country would be better off if our leaders got together and sought the Lord with the big decisions like, do we go to war or not? Do we, do we raise taxes or not? Do we do this? It, and really got together and prayed and worked it through. That would be fantastic. We need to grow in our intellectual humility. Otherwise, you're never going to listen to two things. You're never going to listen to the Holy Spirit, and you're never going to listen to Christian community. Without humility, we're not open to what other people have to say to us. Number three, listen to the mother guardian voice as a child. Listen to the Holy Spirit as an adult. Start listening to the Holy Spirit as an adult. And you might say, well, I don't hear from the Holy Spirit. Well, here's, here's how you learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. You learn in community. Your prayer life is as good or as bad individually as your prayer life is in, in a group. Group prayer facilitates individual prayer. The more you pray together with people, the better you're going to be at praying together, praying alone individually. It's the group thing that empowers the individual thing, not the other way around. And I would invite you to be with people you can pray with together and people that you can grow together. The more you pray with people in a group, the better you're going to be at praying individually. And not just praying, seeking the Lord. If you learn to seek the Lord together with a physical group of people who are seeking the Lord for you, you're going to get better at seeking the Lord individually. You might say, well, I never hear from God. Well, you're always by yourself. We learn from other people. And our trustees group has so grown in listening to the Lord because we're doing it together. And we ask after we've had the big question, we've prayed, what is everyone picking up? And everybody picks up something. It's not because they're spiritual athletes. It's because we've learned to do that together. And learning to do that together makes a big, big difference. Karen and Wendy, you guys are going on a trip and you'll be facing some challenges you don't even know about yet. And you'll have to make some decisions on what to do in that moment, and the time will be to gather a handful of people together and pray, seek the Lord, and work it through together. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to, and to us. We'll make this decision. We'll do this. We'll do that. 
There's nothing in the Bible about how to plan your third day on a mission trip. So you've got to seek the Lord directly. Fellowship is essential for cultivating, listening to, and applying the voice of the Holy Spirit on earth as it is in heaven. If you want to get good at surfing, hang around with good surfers. If you want to be fit, cultivate friendships with fit people and do what they do. If you want to be smarter, hang around people smarter than you, and they will make you smarter. If you, if you want to hear from God more, hang around with people who hear from God. We are affected by the people that we are around. And this is why I'm really concerned that although it's been a great blessing to be able to broadcast, when people, and I'm glad you're watching, those of you are watching, but if that's the limit of your Christian fellowship is watching us on a screen that you can't interact with, then how can people speak into your life on specific things? I want to invite all of you who are able, who are watching this today, to find your way back into physical Christian fellowship. And not just depend on a screen. Bible teaching on a screen is great. Seeking the Lord together with people is better. And I want to invite you to return to physical fellowship. Those of you who are too far away to do that, our faraway friends, we're so glad to have you with us. Start forming fellowship in your home if you don't have it. We can help you do that. We have a group on Sunday nights that does nothing but help people do that. We need each other. Together, excuse me, by ourselves, we tend to be foolish. And the more isolated we are, the more foolish our decisions become. And we become, yeah, I don't even want to think about what I would be like if I didn't have people around me. If you want to practice hearing from the Lord, you can do it every Sunday morning at 9.15. At 10 o'clock, we have our church service. At 9.15, we're over here in the next room, and we seek the Lord based on the passage that we're teaching on that day. I've already prepared. Tamara's already prepared if she's preaching. But we seek the Lord to see if we're missing anything, if there's anything else to add. If there's anything else to add. And we get four, five, six people usually. And those of you who haven't been there, you're missing an opportunity to practice listening to the Lord. Because that's all we do. And then we share it together. And it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And most of those things make it into these messages. So if you don't know how to do this, come join us at 915 and we'll show you how to do this. It's not that hard. You come cable ready for hearing from God, but you probably can't do it on your own. You probably need other people around you to learn how to do it. Also, it's a great motivation for evangelism. Why? Because people who aren't part of the Christian faith and aren't part of real fellowship, I'm not talking just about attending church, I'm talking about working out their lives together with people in close fellowship, seeking the Lord. If people are on their own, they're lost. I, on my own, am lost. Without you folks, I'm as lost as anyone. And we need each other for the guidance we have in life. So don't hesitate to do that. See, it's a motive for reaching the lost because we care about them. Who here has seen people in our culture who are completely lost because they have no community that they're working these things through with and they've got no guidance from the Holy Spirit? Well, that means being lost. And we see it everywhere. And we want to reach them because we care about lost people. We don't want people to go through life just like a, like a, like a pinball steel ball going back and forth, just bouncing off of things. We want people to have the guidance that we share. What about the Bible? The Bible is a source of fantastic general guidance, but it's also a book of examples about how to listen to God. Virtually every major character in the Bible is doing what? Listening to God and working it out through community. They're all doing this. Jack Hayford, the pastor up at Church on the Way, was challenged by a pastor. He says, yeah, Jack, you talk about this direct pipeline to God, but all you need is the Bible. 
And Jack Hafer says, it's in the Bible that I learned that people listen to God directly. <laughs> That's where we learn this. This is where we see this. This is what happens. And it's not some woo-woo thing. You've gotten promptings. And you might say, well, I've never been to church much. I don't really get promptings. <laughs> like, people, you've got a conscience. It was put, it was designed into you. You're about to do something malicious. The warning light, the yellow warning light on your car or your spiritual car goes off. Everybody comes hardwired with that. Cultivate that. The Lord put that there and pay attention to that. Read the Bible, not just to memorize parts of it, which is great. I've memorized a lot of Bible verses. I love doing that. Read it to follow the example of people who are listening to God. And they all do. And a lot of them don't like what they hear. Most of them say, I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. Moses didn't want to do it. Jeremiah didn't want to do it. Isaiah didn't want to do it. Call someone else. But at least they are what? They're listening. So cultivate your listener. I'm going to invite the worship team up here in just a second. And once again, the Bible will tell you that the Lord speaks to us. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Sheep here is plural. So is they. It doesn't say here, my one little sheep hears me and he or she does what? Or follows me. It says here that they follow me. My sheep hear me. The, the group. And when one is separated from the flock, what does Jesus do? He goes out after them to bring them into the flock. We belong in a flock. I did this one closing slide just for Kim, actually. It has nothing to do with the football team. <laughs> we say Notre Dame in, in uh, English, but in French it's Notre Dame. Do you know that most of the major churches in France are called Notre Dame? Which means what? Our Lady. The church as our what? As our mother. And there was a big fire at Notre Dame just recently, and they're rebuilding Notre Dame. And they're hoping to have it ready for the Olympics next year. I think it's important that after COVID, after all the ridiculousness of culture wars and everything else, and all the division in our country, we need to rebuild the church in real fellowship, in real time, coming together, seeking the Lord, so we can know what the Holy Spirit has to say to us and how we can work it out in our lives. Let's pray.